Okay, so in the previous video, I stated this result that uh, if you have a sequence of complex numbers and you want to know what it converges to, well, you can split it into two sequences, a sequence of the real parts of the complex numbers and a sequence of the imaginary parts of the complex numbers. And if this sequence converges, these two sequences will converge, and that's what we're going to prove in a moment. And in fact, the limit of the real, uh, the sequence of the real parts of the complex numbers is going to converge on the real part of the limit of this sequence of complex numbers. So this sequence up here is going to converge to the limit L, and that's made up of this real part L1 plus I times the imaginary part L2. So basically, uh, we can handle sequences of complex numbers by reducing them down into sequences of real numbers, which we know how to handle. Okay, so I'm going to prove now that uh, if the sequence, the original sequence of complex numbers converges to L, then this sequence of the real parts will converge to L1. And uh, what, basically, what we need to do is prove two things. We need to prove, firstly, that if this converges to limit L, then it implies that these two sequences converge to what I've said they converge to. And secondly, we need to prove the other way around. We need to prove that if these two sequences converge, then this sequence converges. So we want to prove both ways. So we're going to go uh, in this direction first. We're going to show that if this sequence converges, it implies that these two sequences converge to what I'm telling you they converge to. Okay, so... Um, a picture is very helpful here. We have our, our sequence of complex numbers here, which is converging to some limit L over here. And L is made up of a real and an imaginary part, so L1 and L2. And again, each of these terms is made up of a real and imaginary part. So basically, because this sequence converges in the complex numbers, what we are given is that uh, we're given what we said up here, that if you give me any, um, any open ball of whatever radius you like around this point L, I can find you a point in the sequence of uh, complex numbers, so some x big N, uh, which is within that open ball, i.e. that if, if little n is greater than or equal to big N, it implies that um, the modulus of x little n minus L uh, is less than epsilon. But basically, uh, if I draw this picture out again, so if we have this open ball here, and we have this point here, which is uh, L, and we have some point here, which is x little n, which is now within this ball. Well, what I can ask is, what's the difference? What, I want to, what I'm trying to prove, remember, is that this sequence converges. If I want to prove that this sequence converges to L1, what do I need to prove? I need to prove uh, that if you give me any epsilon, so what does it mean to prove a real, uh, a real sequence converges to L1? It means that if I take any uh, epsilon interval around L1, so if I take the interval L1 minus epsilon to L1 plus epsilon, on. And then basically I need to be able to find you a point in this sequence, so some a uh, big N again, uh, which is um, uh, a big N, which such that if you go beyond that point, from that point or beyond that term in the sequence, then they're all within this um, within this interval around L1, basically. But I claim that if we just use the same big N here as we use down here, that's going to be true because if we think about this, the real part, the real portion of this point x little n is going to be a little n, and the real portion of this um, of this limit here is l1. And basically, I claim that if this x n is within the epsilon disk in the complex plane, then the real portion of that point x little n is certainly within the epsilon interval around l1. So if this is the epsilon interval, here's the epsilon ball in the epsilon disk in the complex plane, here's the epsilon interval in the real thing. And basically, I can guarantee you that uh, the modulus of a n minus l1 is going to be less than epsilon, providing that the modulus of x little n minus l is less than epsilon. And the reason is, that the distance, the distance between xn and L, uh, this uh, complex modulus function, remember, is uh, the difference between, uh, the definition of how you work this out, remember, the definition of the distance between two complex numbers like this, uh, the modulus, is that you take the difference in their real parts, uh, you take the modulus of that and square it. Of course, if you square it, you don't really need to take the modulus of it because it will take the positive value anyway. So the difference, so if we write these both out as what they are in terms of real and imaginary parts, we'll get that this is a n uh, plus i b n minus uh, l1 plus i l2. 
So all I've done is replace XM with what it is in terms of its real and imaginary parts and replaced L with what it is in terms of its real and imaginary parts. And let me just bring this up a bit. Uh, and basically the definition of complex modulus function is that you just take the difference between the two real parts, take their modulus, uh, AM minus L1, square that, add it to the difference uh, of the two imaginary parts, so BM minus L2, sorry, this is um, getting awkward, squared, in fact, I should just get another piece of paper. And then what you have to, obviously have to do is square root that. But basically, uh, this um, this AN minus L1 is guaranteed to be less than, so AN minus L1 is guaranteed to be less than XN minus L1, base L rather, sorry, because this is the definition of XN minus L here. It's, all, it's guaranteed to be bigger than this because this is a well, actually, it's not guaranteed, it's not a strictly greater, it's either greater than or equal to it, because this is a non-negative number that you are adding on here. So it's going to make this thing in the um, square root bracket, in the radical here, it's going to make it bigger than an minus L1 squared, which means when you square root it, you're going to get something bigger than an minus L1. Of course, there is the possibility that bn minus L2 uh, is uh, equal to zero, i.e. the imaginary parts are equal, in which case this will go to zero and then the, you'd be taking the square root of an minus L1 modulus squared, in which case you just get an minus L1. So there is the possibility that the two are equal. But this one basically is assured to be less than or equal to the size of this. So if I found you a point, if I found you a point in this original sequence of complex numbers, uh, I found you a point which I can do by the definition. So if I found your point uh, after in this sequence of complex numbers after which all of the terms are within the epsilon disk around the limit L, then basically I guarantee you that if we use that exact same point, the corresponding big N, the exact same big N uh, in the sequence of real parts, uh, then all of those will be within the epsilon interval around L1. So basically, uh, if you give me any epsilon and you're asking me to find a point in this sequence of real parts of the complex numbers uh, such that they are with, all within uh, the epsilon interval around L1, uh, then I can just go back to the original sequence and say, okay, find me a point uh, where all of the complex numbers uh, are within the epsilon disk around the whole limit L, and basically I'll just use that exact same point because I've proven that once you're in this o open disk around L, your uh, your imaginary your real part, sorry, is within the epsilon interval of the real part of the limit L, basically. Okay, so let me get a bit more paper. Okay, we'll go over onto the other side. And now the exact same argument holds for the imaginary part, basically. So we have the imaginary sequence, which is b is equal to b1, uh, b2, b3, etc. And we have our original sequence, so I should have put that above, so I'll put it here, x1, x2, and these are the whole complex numbers. So each of the x1, the x1 is a1 plus ib1, so it's the whole complex number, whereas these are just the re imaginary portions of the, real num of the complex numbers, i3, x3, x4, etc. Okay, and we want to show uh, that this converges to L2. So to show that it converges to L2, what I need to do is I need to show that if you take any epsilon interval you like around L2, so if you take the interval L2 minus epsilon to L2 plus epsilon, I need to show you that there is a point in this sequence which I'll call B big M, uh, such that if you take any term beyond uh, that B big M, it's going to be contained within this epsilon interval around L2. So B big N and all terms after it are basically within this epsilon interval of L2. And I need to do that for any arbitrary epsilon. So, I, so to do that, I'll say, okay, let epsilon be an arbitrary number greater than zero. What I need to now do is construct you a big N. And the way I do it is exactly analogous to the way I did it for the real part. I say, okay, uh, we know that the sequence X, which is the sequence of complex numbers here, X1, X2, x3, etc. We know that that sequence converges to L in the metric space of the complex plane. And we know what that means. That means that um, here, if this is the limit L and here's the sequence x, then basically if you draw any epsilon uh, disk or open ball, if you want to view it like that, it is an open ball in this metric space, but often in complex analysis, as I say, it's called an open disk rather than an open ball, because obviously it is a disk. Um, anyway, um, so... Uh, Basically, the definition of this says that uh, the will exist. If we know that this 
sequence of complex numbers converges to L, then what we know is that there exists some big N, which is an element of the natural numbers, such that um, if little n is greater than or equal to big N, it implies that x little n is an element of this open ball around this point L of radius epsilon. So that's why I've constructed this open disk around L, and I'll keep switching between open ball and open disk. This open disk around the point L of radius epsilon. So basically the sum term here, x big N, such that if you take any term in the sequence beyond that, they are all within this open disk. Okay, uh, but now I just use the exact same argument. I say, okay, uh, here is the imaginary portion of the limit L2, the imaginary component, and basically, if you the, if you are within this open disk, uh, if your whole complex number is within this open disk, then your imaginary component is certainly going to be within the epsilon interval of L2. So this is the epsilon interval around L2, and basically, if you're in that disk, your imaginary component is assured to be within this epsilon interval around L2. So again, what we can say is that uh, if you've got x little m, which is within this disk, and you're taking the modulus of x little m minus l, then that is, by definition, it's equal to, uh, if we split this up into the imaginary and complex part, so x little n is a n plus i b n minus, um, and l is l1 plus i l2. So I'm just repeating the same argument because it's worth repeating. Um, okay. Uh, and the definition of this modulus function is that you take the difference of the real parts, the difference of the imaginary parts, you take their modulus, uh, so of course these are just real numbers now, so really you're just taking the absolute value, you're squaring that, you're adding it to uh, the absolute value of bn minus l2, again these are both real numbers, so you're just taking uh, the difference between two real numbers, taking its absolute value, squaring it, of course you don't really need to take the absolute value for squaring it, because it's going to become positive anyway, and then you square root that basically. And because of this definition, I can assure you that the difference bn minus l2, which is how far away if you've got some little, let's say x little n here, then what that is asking is, if this is our bn here, our imaginary component of xn, we're asking how far away is bn from l2, and we want to prove that that's, uh, we want it, well, we want it to be uh, within epsilon, basically, of l2, we want it to be within the epsilon interval, and from the picture it's pretty obvious it is. But basically, symbolically, this is because uh, bn minus l2 is assured to be less than or equal to xn minus l, basically, the modulus of xn minus l, because uh, this number here is strictly non-negative. Uh, so it's either zero or it's positive. So you are adding on either a zero, either zero or a positive number to this. So this thing here is going to be bigger than just this thing squared. So bn minus l2 squared is going to be bigger than, well, it's going to be bigger than or equal to it. So when you square root it, you're going to get something bigger than or equal to bn minus l2. And it's going to have equality when this difference between the real components is just equal to zero. Okay. Right, uh, so uh, now what we have is that bn, the difference between the imaginary, uh, the imaginary component of the term of your sequence and the imaginary component of the limit L is going to be less than the difference between uh, the two complex numbers xn and your limit L. So what we've said is, okay, I can you say that I can find your big N such that if you go to that point of the sequence of complex numbers x1, x2, x3, all the way up to x big N, then if you go to that point and beyond it, this is less than epsilon, strictly less than epsilon, if you go, if you take any x little n from beyond that point. So basically, I'm just saying, okay, we've now got this analogous sequence of imaginary components, b1, b2, b3, just use the exact same big N, go up to the exact, go up to the imaginary component of this complex number here, and I assure you that if you use that tail end of the sequence, any b little n down here will be, uh, an ab will be within the epsilon interval around L2. So basically, you give me any epsilon you, that you want me to get uh, the sequence within, I will uh, construct you an epsilon disk around the limit uh, in the complex plane, and uh, basically, because uh, the uh, complex numbers converge to L in the metric space of the complex plane, I can then uh, I can then just say that uh, if uh, I can find a point x big n such that they are uh, within that disk by the definition of convergence, and once they are within that disk, basically the imaginary com 
the difference between its imaginary component and the imaginary component of the limit is definitely going to be less than epsilon. So that's the way I would construct your big N, basically. Uh, so that's the proof that basically if this sequence converges, if the sequence of complex numbers converges, then um, the sequence of real parts of the complex numbers converges to the real part of the limit L, and the sequence of imaginary parts of the complex numbers converges to the imaginary part of the limit L. In the next video, what we'll do is prove the converse. We'll prove that if the real and imaginary, if we take a sequence of complex numbers, split it up into its sequence of real sorry, you can't see this, if we split it up into its sequence of real components and its sequence of imaginary components, take their limits, and basically, uh, though, uh, basically, if we put those two limits back together, i.e. we add the limit of the, um, of the real components to i times the limit of the imaginary components, then that will be the complex number that overall the co sequence of complex numbers converges to.